So this year, 2021, in case you're watching this in the future, how is it, by the way? Did we make it? Anyway, this year makes 30 years since the premiere of the movie Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. You know, the one Kevin Costner plays Robin Hood, decides to just stop even trying to do an English accent like 20 minutes in. Alan Rickman plays the Sheriff of Nottingham. It's got that Brian Adams song on the soundtrack, Everything I Do, I Do It For You. Brian Adams' second number one single, by the way. You know what the first one was? Heaven. Can you believe that? Who even remembers that song? I had to look it up, for Christ's sake. What's that tell you? I'm not saying it's bad. It's a fine song. I'm a white guy who grew up in the 80s and innate love of the entire oeuvre of Brian Adams is coded into my genome, but come on. Summer of 69? Cuts Like a Knife, Run to You, none of them make it to number one, but heaven tops the charts? I smell a fix. How many wedding DJs could possibly have bought that record that year? And by the way, I'm sure some of my fellow white guys who grew up in the 80s are watching this going, what's he talking about? I don't have an innate love of the entire oeuvre of Brian Adams. And for you, I have just one question. How does it feel to be a liar in your own heart? Leaving that and the Brian Adams payola scandal I may have blown the lid off of a minute ago aside, I figured, since this year is 30 years since the movie opened, that I would watch Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves again. Back in the day, it was one of my favorite movies. I owned it on VHS, watched it I don't know how many times. Then, as I grew into a cynical know-it-all teenager and an even more insufferable young adult, my appreciation of the film dropped rather significantly. Before I watched it just recently, I hadn't seen it in, shit, close to 20 years. And I don't know, maybe it's the nostalgia factor, maybe I'm getting sentimental in my burgeoning geriatrism, but watching it this time, the movie seemed kind of good. It's not a perfect movie, for sure. It's flawed, it's uneven, it's hard to tell if it's being sincere or silly, if it wants us to take it seriously or laugh at it. Sometimes it seems to switch back and forth between those modes from one moment to the next. It's like a Brian Adams song. At the center of it, as Robin Hood, stands Kevin Costner, doing some of the least celebrated work in a career full of shrug-inducing performances. His Default screen persona is so laid back that it's difficult to judge how much of an effort he's actually making. Is he trying his best? Is he just sleepwalking his way through? I'm not sure I could even tell the difference between Kevin Costner going for it and Kevin Costner phoning it in. And that way, he's a lot like Brian Adams. Stop it. You've got to stop it. Not everything is analogous to Brian Adams. Just stop it. <laughs> Costner's performance is the key that unlocks the movie, I think. If you can find your way to appreciating Costner's take on Robin Hood, you'll enjoy what the rest of the movie is trying to do as well. It's true that Costner doesn't exactly take the opportunity to stretch himself as an actor. His Robin Hood gives the impression of Bull Durham after he's gone to war and had most of the brashness knocked out of him. He gives up on the accent early on, and his performance feels out of step with most of the other actors in the film. But I think that's why it and the movie work to the extent that they do. When we meet Robin at the start of the film, it's the late 12th century, and he and his friend Peter have gone off to fight in the Crusades. Only that didn't go so well for them, because they've been captured. Actually, they were captured like 20 years ago, judging by the Rip Van Winkle look Robin's got working there. However long they've been there, it's hand-chopping day, which means it's time to go! Robin bravely offers to take Peter's place on the chopping block, then starts a fight with the guards and makes a run for it with Peter and a Moorish prisoner named Azim, who offers to help them find their way out of the prison. And, I mean, come on, it never hurts to have Morgan Freeman along. As long as he's not driving. Peter gets mortally wounded on the way out, and as he dies, he asks Robin to promise to look after his sister Marion. Robin's like, sure, dude. 
After stopping off for a haircut and a shave, Robin travels back to England with Azim, who credits Robin with saving his life and has pledged to remain by his side until he can save Robin's life in return. Robin and Azim have a nice bit of getting to know you chat while they spend the afternoon walking the several hundred miles from the beach to Robin's family home in Nottingham. Azim tells Robin about a beautiful woman he knew back home, a woman he loved so much she was worth dying for. And Robin laughs at him. A woman worth dying for? <laughs> you and your strange Mohammedan ways. It's a bit obvious. We already know Robin has promised to protect Peter's sister Marion, and now here he is scoffing at the idea of loving another person so much you would die for them. Even if you're not already familiar with the Robin Hood legend, it doesn't take a witch to read the chicken blood to know where this is going, but it does serve well enough to set up Robin's character arc for the film. Or rather, his second character arc. He's already completed one character arc by the time the film starts. We don't get to see any of that, but we hear about it and we can deduce that it's happened from the way Robin interacts with the other characters in the film. It seems that the Robin who comes back is not the same person who went away, however many years ago that was. The Crusades have changed him. Years of fighting in foreign lands have filled Robin with that most essential quality for 1990s movie heroes, angst, but he's pretty happy when he makes it back home to England, so after a quick run-in with a gang of the Sheriff of Nottingham's men, the movie decides to top off Robin's angst meter by having him return home to find that his family's castle has been burned and his father murdered and hung from the rafters. Robin, filled with regret over having left for the Crusades on bad terms with his old man, buries his father, kneels by the grave, and says to himself, I gotta get some revenge for this. But his time in the Crusades has given Robin something besides sadness and grim motivation. He also has a new perspective on life and society. When he shows up at Marion's place and announces that he's sworn to protect her, she laughs him off, reminding him that before the Crusades, he was an arrogant bully. He tells her that he's changed, but she doesn't believe him. At least, she doesn't believe him yet. Robin's visit to Marion is cut short by the sheriff's gang, who chase Robin, Azim, and Robin's blind servant, Duncan, who survived the attack on Robin's father's castle, into Sherwood Forest. There, they run into the Merry Men, not referred to as such in the movie, but that's who they are. Robin bests Little John in a fight, earning their respect, and later everybody is hanging out in the outlaw's camp, passing around a jug of mead, and we see more evidence that Robin has changed, and that these changes have left him a little out of step with his peers. One of the merry men goes to pass the jug in front of Azim without offering him some, and Robin says, Has English hospitality changed so much in six years? Okay, so six years. Robin's been away at the Crusade for six years. I guess I could go back and correct the earlier, less specific references in the script, but I'm not going to. Obviously. Anyway, Robin wants to know why they were going to deprive his buddy Azim of Little John's surely delicious homemade mead. The guy with the jug says, he's a savage. And Robin thinks a moment, nods, grins faintly, and says that he is but no more than you or I. Man, I liked Robin better before he got woke. By the Crusades. Later in the movie, when he's rallying the Merry Men to fight back against the tyranny of the Sheriff of Nottingham, Robin shares another lesson he learned during those six years away from home. When someone points out that the Sheriff's forces will have them outnumbered, Robin says, one free man defending his home is worth ten hired soldiers. Then he points to Azim and adds, The Crusades taught me that. Robin's story in the film consists of more than just him calling upon the wisdom he learned during the Crusades to speak out for racial equality and rally outlaws and peasants to rise up against an oppressive government. He also falls in love with Marion and realizes by the end that Azim is right. It is possible to care about someone else so much that you'd be willing to die for them. But the Robin-Marion romance is a pretty standard component of the Robin Hood story. Prince of Thieves also shows us Robin having to atone for some of the sins he committed in his less admirable pre-Crusades days. 
For about the first two-thirds of the movie, Merry Man Will Scarlet has been going out of his way to be a dick to Robin. The rest of the gang has accepted Robin and acknowledged him as their leader, but Will is still like, Hey Robin! You suck! And finally Robin's like, So, what's up with you hating my guts this much? What did I ever do to you? And that's when Will tells him, I'm your half-brother. After your mother died, our father had an affair with my mother, but he sent her away because you told him to, because you couldn't bear the thought of another woman taking your mother's place. Because of you, my mother had to raise me alone, and I had to grow up without a father. I have more of a reason to hate you than anyone else, because you ruined my life. At first, Robin is shocked, angry, then shaken by the revelation of the pain he unknowingly caused someone else, stung by the reminder of what an asshole he used to be. Then he looks at Will, proclaims, I have a brother, embraces him, and promises not to leave or send Will away again, but to stand with him until the end. Robin doesn't apologize for breaking up their father and Will's mother, but Costner plays the scene in such a way that his grief and regret are obvious. He doesn't defend himself or make excuses when Will tells the story and accuses Robin of ruining his life. He listens. He accepts it. And, though not in so many words, he resolves to do better by Will from now on. One of the knocks on the movie all along these past 30 years has been that it's too dark, too violent. People expect a Robin Hood movie to be a rousing, swashbuckling action-adventure story like in the film starring Douglas Fairbanks or Errol Flynn, or a charming, light-hearted comedy like Disney's animated version. And sure, compared to those, Prince of Thieves is pretty grim, what with its multiple sword stabbings, scary witch, and people smearing shit on themselves. But the thing is, underneath that gloomy patina, this is a rousing, swashbuckling action-adventure story. Yes, it's a little more violent. Yes, it has some truly dark moments. Hello, third act attempted sexual assault of Marion. But it's also got your clash-clang sword fights and people living in trees and amazing feats of clutch archery and heroes swinging to the rescue through windows. All the big, goofy action beats you would expect from a Robin Hood movie. It's not the sanitized, brightly colored depiction of the Middle Ages we got from Fairbanks, Flynn, or Disney, but it's just as theatrical and silly and Hollywood in its own way. The big difference is that Robin himself has depth and regret and room to grow as a character, and that's why I think Kevin Costner's performance works. Yeah, the lack of an English accent is probably due more to his limitations as an actor than a conscious artistic choice, but it's more than the accent. He plays Robin Hood as serious, understated, slightly haunted, while this loopy adventure movie filled with other actors giving deliriously over-the-top performances is happening all around him. Costner's Robin Hood clashes with everything else in the movie, but it works because in the story, Robin himself clashes with the rest of his society. He used to fit in. He used to have a place here, a life of privilege in a castle but he's returned from the Crusades to find that all of that is gone. And his time in the Crusades has changed his attitude about a lot of things. He is different, significantly different, than the world around him. And again, I don't know if that's supposed to be the point, if it's the result of purposeful decisions made by the creators, or if it just kind of turned out that way. But for me, it works. Just like the music of Brian Adams. I'm done. That's the last Brian Adams reference, I promise. I had to shoehorn that one in anyway. And it's not totally accurate. I only really dig his stuff up to waking up the neighbors. It's all downhill from there. After Everything I Do was such a huge hit, he started just churning out power ballads for movie soundtracks and got so cheesy and repetitive that even I mostly stopped paying attention. That was all one Brian Adams reference. And like I said, it's the last one. I'm seriously done with that. I can stop this thing I started. Fuck. Let's talk about the second most important heroic character in the movie. Azim 
played by Morgan Freeman, who was just picking up some work in between Oscar nominations, you know how it goes. It's easy enough to categorize Azim as a magical Negro, and I'm certainly not going to argue that he doesn't exemplify that particular trope at times throughout the film. The defining trait of a magical Negro character is that they are a black character who exists in the narrative to help the white protagonist along on their journey, and Azim is certainly that. He is there to help Robin Hood, literally and narratively and thematically, but he's also more than that. For one thing, while Azim is functionally Robin's sidekick for most of the movie, he's also quite willing and able to speak up for himself. His association with Robin begins during the opening jailbreak scene when Azim sees Robin struggling in vain to free some of his fellow Englishmen from their chains. You cannot save those people, Christian, but you can save me, says Azim, who is not chained but merely lashed to the wall. When Robin hesitates, Azim throws in the bit about knowing the way out, but initially, his pitch is pretty straightforward. My life is worth no less than your white Christian fellow prisoners, and unlike them, you can save my life. He's asserting his value, not just as someone who knows a thing or two and can be of use to Robin, but as a human being. Azim doesn't lose that independence or self-assuredness after he pledges himself to be Robin's protector, either. When they reach England, Robin asks Azim to free himself from his pledge and return home. Azim refuses, so Robin gives the Iggy to the other guys on the boat, and they jump Azim from behind. Azim kicks the shit out of one of them, and the others decide to take the hint and just get back on the damn boat. Robin's like, you know what, Azim? You're pretty cool and invites him to come home with him. As they walk away, Robin turns to Azim and says, You understand, I had to try. Meaning, I had to try to have those guys kill you just now. I'm not so sure you had to, but never mind. Azim doesn't take it personally, though. He just says, If it was me, I would have succeeded. And I'm sure he would have, because he's a boss. On the walk back to Loxley, when Robin has a run-in with the Sheriff of Nottingham's goons, Azim is on top of a hill praying when the fighting starts. Robin yells for Azim to come redeem his vow, but Azim ignores him and keeps right on praying. Robin does okay for himself in the brawl, and the Sheriff's men retreat. Afterwards, he gets in Azim's face about it, and Azim says, I fulfill my vow when I choose. That might seem like a screenwriter shortcut to explain why Azim isn't constantly at Robin Hood's side or always running in to save the day when the swords get to slashing and the arrows start flying, and maybe it is, but it serves another purpose by establishing unmistakably that Azim is not Robin's servant and, this is especially important given the racial identities of the two characters, not his slave. When Robin asks Azim why he's always walking behind him, Azim explains that since in England he is the infidel, it's safer for him to appear as though he is Robin's slave. But that's a decision Azim has made for himself, and which Robin seems ambivalent about. For his part, Robin always treats Azim as an equal, even when they aren't getting along. They quickly develop a comfortable rapport, which we see an example of during their journey to Loxley, when Robin asks Azim, what his name means. It means great one, Azim answers. Really? Robin asks with a smirk. Did you give yourself this name? And Azim just kind of gives him a look and walks away. Note that he didn't deny it. The movie also largely avoids falling into the trap of portraying Azim as a noble savage, which is another common, though not quite universal, characteristic of magical Negro characters that he may seem simple, but he's wiser than you or I thing. To the contrary, Azim usually comes across as the smartest character in the movie, and not in a patronizing, mystical, wisdom of the ages way either. I mean, the dude's carrying around a telescope while the European characters don't even know what one is. In fact, when Robin looks through the telescope for the first time, when they see the sheriff's men riding toward Marion's castle, it takes him a minute to work out that it's only making them look like they're closer. His clueless ass even pulls his sword and pokes at them with the telescope to his eye, drawing an I-can't-believe-this-shit reaction from Azim. He also knows something about birth and babies, as we see when he helps Little John's wife Fanny through a difficult childbirth. Azim alone is able to deduce the problem that the fetus hasn't turned. 
When Robin asks Azim if he knows what he's doing, Azim assures him that he's seen this kind of thing many times before. With horses? Well, how different could it be? Azim helps both Fanny and the baby survive the ordeal. Friar Tuck protests, insisting that Azim has been sent by the devil, but Robin convinces Fanny to let Azim help, and when it's all over, Friar Tuck finds Azim and apologizes. He says, The Lord has taught me a fine lesson today, that though I may think I am godly, I know I am not worldly. And he offers Azim his hand in friendship, which Azim accepts. There are a few incidents of Azim enduring initial disrespect from his white European comrades. Azim always suffers these incidents with patience and grace, and the white folks see the error of their ways and apologize and accept Azim as their equal and trusted friend. And that's probably a fantasy, especially for the 12th century when there's a literal holy war going on. But it's a good fantasy for modern audiences to see, especially us white folks. We like to say we got the message when most of us haven't bothered to read it. Know what I mean? To be fair, sometimes these exchanges between Azim and the white characters are a bit too teachable momentish, which doesn't help to dispel the perception of the character as a magical Negro type. In particular, there's the scene between Azim and the child who asks, Did God paint you? And instead of walking away, muttering under his breath about what a racist little shit this kid is, Azim smiles and says, for certain, because Allah loves wondrous variety. It's a nice moment, but again, it casts Azim as the black person who is there to help the white people be better. By the time Azim actually does fulfill his vow by saving Robin's life near the end of the movie, the two of them have genuinely become friends. That's probably why Azim decides to stick around for Robin and Marion's wedding, though he also seizes the opportunity to blow everyone else off the screen fashion-wise. Seriously, dude shows up dressed like that? You've got to ask why anyone else even bothered. Also, Azim is the only one of the wedding guests who doesn't bow down when King Richard shows up. Good for you, Azim. He doesn't need to be bowing to Richard anyway. Azim's a king himself. King shit a fuck mountain. When Robin Hood Prince of Thieves opened, many of the reviews were pretty unkind, and even some of the more positive ones singled out the movie's alleged pandering to modern political sensibilities and cultural sensitivities. In his review in the Chicago Tribune, Dave Keir writes about how most of the changes the film makes to the classic Robin Hood story are of this sort, cynical accommodations made to multiculturalism and feminism as embodied on screen by Marion, who is, quote, now allowed to fight back, have opinions, and ogle Robins behind. A woman in a movie with agency, a mind of her own, and the capacity to feel sexual desire, not just be the object of it? What's next? The right to vote? In 1991, the term political correctness was just coming into popular usage, and Robin Hood Prince of Thieves was derided for being too politically correct. There are two points to make about this. First, if you're one of those people complaining about how everything is too woke now, you should know that your shitty parents and grandparents were complaining about the same stuff before you were even born. You're not saying anything new, or anything that needs to be said, or heard or taken seriously by anyone, so shut up and take a seat. Or leave me a pissy comment about it that I will delete before anyone else sees it. Up to you. Second, the movie's not even that politically correct. Let's look at the character of Marion, played by Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio. She definitely has more agency than the character typically has in previous tellings of the Robin Hood story. In her first scene in the film, she kicks Robin's ass while disguised as a knight. He only discovers that his attacker is Marion when she screams after he burns her hand with a candle during their struggle. And even then, she immediately follows up with a knee tap to the dick that puts him on the floor. So I think she technically wins the fight. The empowerment of Marion goes beyond letting her get in on some of the action. After Robin recovers from his groin injury, he discovers that, in the years since he left for the Crusades, Marion has become an important figure in Nottingham, a local leader of sorts, 
With the king out of the country, the sheriff of Nottingham has been using violence and intimidation to acquire land, forcing people out of their homes. Marion has opened the gates of her estate to these displaced people. Since she's a cousin to the king, she's been able to do this without reprisal from the sheriff. She's using her privilege to not only protect herself, but to protect and provide for others. Marion's romance with Robin, while inevitable, is also presented in a way that's a bit more believable than in earlier tellings. It feels rooted in character rather than in plot necessity. Marion is initially skeptical of Robin, remembering him as, in her words, a spoiled bully who used to burn my hair as a child. But later, when she visits the encampment in Sherwood Forest and sees that Robin has changed, that he is acting selflessly, helping peasants and outcasts fight back against injustice and authoritarianism, she softens and her attitude toward him begins to change. In Prince of Thieves, Robin and Marion's romance isn't just based on physical attraction or the structural demands of the story, but on what feels, to me at least, like genuine mutual admiration. So that's all well and good. I like Marion in this movie, especially compared to how she's portrayed in earlier productions, but when it comes right down to it, she's still more or less the love interest who's mainly there to play the damsel in distress so that Robin can swoop in and rescue her at the climax. By the third act, most of her agency is gone, and she's reduced to the role of the Sheriff of Nottingham's extremely reluctant bride-to-be. Her most memorable moments in the film's concluding portion involve her being dragged, kicking and screaming, literally, to the altar. And then there's that attempted rape, which is unfortunate no matter the presentation, and made even worse by the fact that it's played for laughs. I don't know who said, hey, you know what would make this scene of the villain trying to force himself on the female lead better? Some mugging and light slapstick. But that's definitely a note that should not have been taken. The script does try to give Marion some small measure of revenge against the sheriff, since Robin kills him with the dagger he gave to Marion, which Marion in turn gave to Robin, but it's still Robin doing the killing while Marion just kind of stands there. She even gets upstaged at her wedding to Robin when the king himself, played by Sean Connery in a genuinely impressive bit of stunt casting, shows up unexpectedly to give her away. The point is, yes, Marion is more of a character and less of a plot device in this movie than in earlier Robin Hood films, but ultimately, she can't completely escape the damsel in distress trope. The people who objected to the movie for being overly feminist were complaining about a handful of creative decisions that slightly strengthened the role of the only important female character, sorry Fanny, in the movie. So, as far as that goes, not much has really changed in 30 years. Even the most ardent detractors of Prince of Thieves generally give it credit for at least one thing, Alan Rickman's gloriously camp turn as the Sheriff of Nottingham. I already mentioned how Kevin Costner gives this relatively subdued, some with a less forgiving opinion of the film than mine might say wooden, performance, while there's a great big action-adventure movie happening all around him. Rickman clearly knows what kind of a movie he's in, and seems determined to use every moment of his screen time to make sure that we know it too. As I said, Costner is the exception. Pretty much every other featured cast member is swinging for the fences here. Mike McShane is Friar Tuck, Geraldine McEwen is Scary Witch Lady Mortiana, Nick Brimble is Little John, Brian Blessed as Robin's father, Lord Loxley. He's only in the movie for a few minutes before they kill him off, but sweet Jesus does he make the most of it. Does the castle look like that because of a fire or from Brian Blessed chewing the scenery? And yet, even among shamelessly, delightfully hammy peers such as these, Alan Rickman manages to stand out. He doesn't just chew the scenery, he swallows entire scenes. He dominates every frame in which he's present. His Sheriff of Nottingham is an unhinged buffoon, as cartoonishly inept as he is vicious. His hair is black and untamed, his limbs flail wildly during his many tantrums, his bearded face is constantly sweaty and red, he's incapable of keeping his shit together in response to the slightest setback to his preposterous ambitious schemes. 
According to the trivia page on the movie's IMDb entry, Rickman was reluctant to take the role of the sheriff and only agreed when the film's director, Kevin Reynolds, agreed to let him do whatever he wanted. It may have been the smartest decision Reynolds made in the entire production. Pretty much every memorable line in the film belongs to Rickman. Many of them weren't in the shooting script, but were added by Rickman himself. And this includes a moment where a frustrated sheriff turns to two peasant girls crouching in the hall of his castle and says, You, be in my room at 10.30. You, 10.45. Bring a friend before stalking away. It also includes my favorite exchange, and perhaps the most quoted line in the movie, when the sheriff catches Robin Hood visiting the local bishop and bellows as Robin makes his escape, I'm gonna cut your heart out with a spoon! Later, his cousin and chief lackey, Guy of Gisborne, asks thoughtfully, Why a spoon? Why not an axe? To which the sheriff answers, Because it's dull, you twit. It'll hurt more. It's a funny line, delivered with exasperated disdain by Rickman, and it gets a payoff later on when the sheriff, frustrated by yet another failure from Guy, who runs him through with a sword, offering the excuse, At least I didn't use a spoon. At times, Rickman might actually be too good. He's so much fun as the sheriff that even with as evil as he definitely is, it can be difficult to root against him, especially in scenes when he's directly opposite Costner's much more subdued Robin Hood. And he's such a hapless fuck-up that he never really comes across as much of a threat. Like, you know Robin Hood is going to kill the Sheriff of Nottingham eventually anyway, because that's how the story goes, but you definitely see it coming with this sheriff unless he somehow trips and falls on his own sword before Robin has a chance to stab him. <laughs> With his own dagger. Jesus, what a clown. Maybe they had him try to rape Marion in a final, last-ditch effort to get him over as a heel? But then it really makes no sense why that bit is shot and played like comedy. The sheriff's demise might be a foregone conclusion, but Rickman makes the most of it anyway, treating us to one of the most awesomely overplayed death scenes I've ever seen. Just watch this. Dude staggers around, pulls out the knife, shows it to Marion, drops it, staggers around some more, crawls up onto a window ledge, strains up toward the sun, and finally collapses and turns over and dies, all while Robin and Marion just kind of stand around watching like, shit, this has taken a while. I guess we should just wait? Look, I'm not saying it's a great movie, but it is a good one. A much better one than its critical reputation these past 30 years has suggested. It's a bit long. The theatrical cut runs 2 hours and 20 minutes, and the extended cut, which was released on home video, clocks in at 10 minutes longer. And there are times when the uneven tone works against it, when it's either too goofy or too gory for its own good. But... For as many flaws as there are in the screenplay by Penn Densham and John Watson, there are lots of things it does right. The plotting is mostly confident and efficient. Robin's skill as an archer is demonstrated without beating us over the head with it. The film's many characters are introduced and established clearly, and most of the heroes, even those with just a few scenes, are all given moments to shine. Little John and Fanny have a sweet exchange as their gang is storming the castle. Will Scarlet gets to drop the movie's only F-bomb after he watches Robin and Azim successfully catapult over the castle wall. Friar Tuck gets to be the one who kills the traitorous bishop. There are even a few poetic flourishes, like how Marion gives Robin the sheriff's dagger, and the sheriff ends up carrying the sword that belonged to Robin's father. As a director, no one would ever mistake Kevin Reynolds for George Miller, but he keeps up a good pace, moving things along at a steady clip despite the unnecessarily long running time. He handles the action scenes well, building and blowing off tension in good time, staging and shooting sequences with excitement and clarity, using slow motion and extreme close-ups judiciously and effectively. And he finds a signature shot, the close-up of Robin, his eyes fixed sharply toward the camera as he aims his bow, that's dramatic and memorable without feeling forced. And the acting is mostly very good. 
It doesn't matter that it's big and theatrical because it's that kind of movie. And when I say the acting is mostly very good, that includes Kevin Costner, goddammit. His performance has been ridiculed and dismissed for 30 years. But the thing is, I don't think it's that bad. I don't think it's bad at all. Like I said earlier, he's a lot more low-key than the rest of the cast, particularly Rickman, but it suits his interpretation of the character. And most importantly, there's emotional truth to the performance. I believe him. I accept him as Robin Hood. It's not an Oscar-worthy performance or anything, but Costner won the Razzie this year for Worst Actor, and come on, that's just ridiculous. This is the same year Vanilla Ice starred in Cool as Ice. This is the same year Bruce Willis starred in Hudson Hawk. This is the same year Mickey Rourke and Don Johnson starred in Harley Davidson and the Marlboro Man. Are you seriously going to tell me Kevin Costner deserved Worst Actor for Robin Hood? He's just not that goddamn bad. More than anything, I enjoy the film's adventurous, oh hell, let's just go for it spirit. It's a swashbuckling romantic action epic with a cast full of charismatic actors who are absolutely going for it, a fantastic score by Michael Kamen, a silly and sometimes randomly weird sense of humor. Friar Tuck breaks the fourth wall to literally wink at the audience in the film's final moments. I can only assume he's finally gotten so drunk that he can see through the boundaries separating his reality from our own. And a degree of social consciousness that many viewers at the time didn't expect and some didn't care for, but to hell with them anyway. What I'm saying is, I was wrong to write this movie off as a teenager and young adult. I had it right the first time when I was an 11-year-old wearing out my VHS copy. This is a good movie. Maybe you disagree with me, and that's fine. Art is subjective, as is what we think about it and feel about it and what it means to us. But maybe a few of you are like I was. You remember it being a bad movie, but it's been a while since the last time you saw it. And if that's the case, I'd invite you to give it another chance. Watch it again. Maybe. Just maybe. You'll agree with me. Search your heart. Search your soul. Okay, that's the last one. Please believe me. Every word I say is true. Can't stop this thing we started.